what's up my channel it's your friendly neighborhood sassy blonde writer coming at you with another writing video today we are continuing our discussion on reboots remakes retellings and adaptations now last time we were here we talked about remakes and reboots today we are talking about retellings i was gonna try to include adaptations in here but i had so much to say about retellings and then i also realized that it gets a little confusing with retellings and adaptations so i figured it'd just be easier to make that a separate video so here we are. Like I said before, the focus of today is on retelling. In the first video where I kind of kicked off this topic, I, where I talked about if fan fiction is good or bad for your writing, and I talked about the perks that you get out of writing fan fiction, and I'll link to that video down below if you want to check that one out. Um, I kind of go over what a retelling is, but today I'm going to go into more depth with it. Before we get started, I just want to say, please make sure you subscribe to my channel. I post new videos on Wednesdays. It would just make my day if you subscribed, and uh, yeah. If you enjoy this type of topic, leave a comment below to let me know that you're enjoying it, so that way I know you want to hear about this sort of topic in the future. All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's get started. If you are retelling a story, that means you are writing it, telling it, or presenting it in a way that is different from the original story. So you take the basic plot or the premise of it, but you change it up and make updates to it in a way that suits your needs or your writing style. And there are many different ways to do that, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Usually, a retelling will update things from the source material that didn't age very well. Like, for example, everything in the Hans Christian Andersen version of The Little Mermaid. Thank you, Myths and Legends podcast, for enlightening me about that. And also incorporate elements the author thinks would strengthen the story either from a writing perspective or help smooth over some plot holes from the original, that sort of thing. This is extremely common with pretty much anything that's in the public domain. So the term public domain, in case you don't know, refers to creative materials that are not protected by intellectual property laws such as copyright, trademark, or patent laws. The public owns these works, which is why it says public, um, not an individual author or artist. Anyone can use the public domain work without obtaining permission, but that also means that no one can ever own it. The so works can enter the public domain because they're really, really old or because the author put them in the public domain. So for our purposes, we're gonna focus on stuff that's on stories that are already in the public domain. Those are basically the easiest ones to find examples for when we're talking about retelling. So, the most common examples of retelling that you can find in literature and movies, TV shows, musicals, plays, video games are stuff in the public domain, like I said before. So a lot of these stories are really, really old. So, like for example, Shakespeare, Arthurian legends, Jane Austen and her contemporaries, like the Bronte sisters and Mary Shelley. Yes, Jane Austen and the creator of Frankenstein were alive at the same time. <laughs> Nursery rhymes, which can be retold or put together like in Shrek. Myths and legends like in Percy Jackson and Rick Riordan Presents. Or folk tales, fairy tales, and fables like in Into the Woods and Once Upon a Time. Sassy Blonde Editor here. I realized that the details of public domain stories and retellings are a bit easier to explain if you use an example, and I did include that in the original video, so I thought I'd do that here with an example to kind of explain how that works. Just a reminder, I am not a lawyer, so this isn't legal advice, just an explanation on how public domain functions with retellings. If you want to do further reading, I suggest you check out the article I linked to down below from Stanford University on the subject matter. It's the article I used to do this video that explains what public domain is and how it functions, or you can consult with an intellectual property lawyer as well. So the example I'm going to use is Cinderella. Why am I using Cinderella? Well, Cinderella is a fairy tale, and the original fairy tale was told by the Brothers Grimm. It's a very old fairy tale, so the copyright that they would have had has already expired and it's in the public domain. That's why there are a bunch of different versions of the Cinderella story floating around us. My personal modern favorite is the Cinderella story with Hilary Duff and Chad Michael Murray, but that's just me. Now, the people who write these stories cannot own the copyright to the original source material, the Brothers Grimm's Cinderella story, because that's in the public domain. However, the version that these authors write, they're retelling of Cinderella. 
is their intellectual property. And any illustrations, and in some cases music, will often have the copyrights as well. An example of this happening in music is when an old piece like something by Mozart, something very old, goes into the public domain. A piece of music is old, however, a recording of the New York Philharmonic playing it is not in the public domain. So that is a little thing to keep in mind when you're thinking of talking about public domain. So that means that while they can't necessarily do anything about you writing another retelling of Cinderella, you will have to make sure it is distinct from other retellings that already exist. Because the version that they write their retelling of Cinderella is their intellectual property. Again, I'm not a lawyer and this isn't legal advice. And if you have more questions, I've linked to the article by Stanford University on public domain down below if you want to do more research on your own. There are many different ways to approach retellings depending on how close you want to stay to the original. I think of it like they're on a spectrum. On one side, you have really faithful retellings. On the other side, you have stories that are loose retellings or stories that are inspired by blank. And then in the middle is where I would put fractured retellings, is what I call them. And I'll explain what that is in a little bit. A faithful retelling is where you basically take the same characters, the same plot, and the same story beats from the original, and you kind of transpose it and you put it into a new setting or genre or whatever. Sometimes you change a few things around here and there, like things that didn't age really well. For example, when they updated the story Emma by Jane Austen to make the movie Clueless, and they changed the age gap between the two lovebirds as well as the setting because the age gap didn't really age well when they were changing the setting and time period to the 90s in California. Because in the original, and they also changed the fact that in the original, the two lovebirds were cousins, so they changed that. That's something to consider, especially if you're doing an older story. That's also something to watch out for. A lot of times there are things like that in the plots of those older books and plays. That is, that is always something that you want to look out for, things that didn't age well. And when you do a faithful retelling, it's completely okay if you're updating it to update that sort of thing. You can also change things like the genders of the main cast. You can add people of color. You can add LGBTQ plus characters as well to your story, like in Great by, I'm gonna try to say her name correctly, Sarah Benacasa, which is a queer retelling of The Great Gatsby. You are always welcome to add diversity to those stories that you are retelling. Another thing you can do is you can make updates um, in a faithful retelling that reflect the values from the source material in a way that might make more sense to a modern audience. So like when they updated Pride and Prejudice, the original by Jane Austen, for the Lizzie Bennet Diaries web series retelling and changed the focus in the story from marriage as an economic decision to searching for your, your first post-grad job as an economic decision after the 2008 recession. The reason why they make this change in the updated version, in the retelling, is because in the original version of Pride and Prejudice, Lizzie Bennet gets a marriage proposal and rejects it because she doesn't love the person who proposed to her. To a modern audience, this seems like a no-brainer. Of course she doesn't want to marry someone she doesn't love. However, back then, this was a decision similar to saying no to a really high-paying job because you don't love the job. Marriage back in Jane Austen's time was an economic decision. Just like nowadays, getting your first job right out of college is an economic decision. So by updating it from a marriage proposal to a job proposal, it made it more clear to a modern audience what the stakes were and how this would impact Lizzie's potential future. So again, stuck with the spirit and the values from the original, but it made it more accessible to a modern audience. When you do a faithful retelling, you can basically change everything but the characteristics of the main characters and the main plot. The main reason why is because if you change too many of the story beats and if you change the characters too much, it's not very faithful to the original. Think about it. It's not really faithful Pride and Prejudice retelling, you know, the most famous hate to love arc in romance. If your retelling starts with Lizzie and Mr. Darcy falling in love immediately. Then, like I said before, in the middle of the spectrum, you have what I call a fractured retelling, which comes from the phrase 
fractured fairy tale. So a fractured fairy tale takes a classic fairy tale or children's story and adds a twist. The twist can be anything from changing the characters, adding characters from other fairy tales like Into the Woods, or making it more modern in language and setting. A fractured fairy tale will change elements of the original story so much that the meaning of the story can change so much and be fractured or broken off from the original. A great example of this is the book Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine. So I guess spoiler alert for that if you haven't read it yet. And if you haven't read it yet, you should. So Ella Enchanted is a retelling of Cinderella where Ella is a child with the gift of obedience that quickly turns into a curse where she has to wait on her stepmother and stepsisters. They're not necessarily evil, but they are very greedy and very selfish, and they abuse Ella's gift and make her do all the chores. They don't let her shower. It, it becomes a very abusive situation. On top of that, Ella is constantly in danger because if she is asked to do anything, even put herself in danger, even cut off her own head, she has to do it. That is her curse. And while most fairy tales paint woman as a lovely creature who needs to be rescued, Ella Enchanted shows us a fairy tale heroine that we want to root for because she never stops trying to find a way to break the curse. In the end, the prince that she falls in love with isn't actually what saves her, and also him asking her to marry her isn't what saves her at all. In fact, she breaks the curse by saying, no, I won't marry you. If specifically, he says, marry me, which, I mean, it's supposed to be like, marry me, like a question, but he's, it's not phrased as a question, it's phrased as a command. The spell doesn't care about voice inflection, so it took it as a command, and she has to say no because she has to be selfless in this moment, in this moment, as much as she loves the prince and she wants to be with him, if she's his wife with this curse, she puts the entire kingdom in danger. So she fights against herself and from within she is able to find the strength to break free and break the curse. Now I know there are a lot of Cinderella haters out there. I'd say that the original story of Cinderella is kind of one of just like kind of rewarding of like just keep working hard and you'll be rewarded in due time. But this is an example of a fractured fairy tale because that's not the moral of this story. It's not about working hard and kind of biding your time and knowing you'll be rewarded someday for your hard work. It's about finding strength within and to never give up and never stop standing up for yourself. So that's why it's an example of a fractured fairy tale. And Gail Carson Levine does that with a lot of her stories. In another book, more of a companion novel to Ella Enchanted, it's the book Fairest, which uh, does the same thing, the fairy tale Snow White, and it's about the theme of finding beauty within because the main character does not fit beauty standards of the town and kingdom, really, that she lives in. So her whole life she thought she was ugly, and then she ends up finding beauty within Really nice story. But again, so they took the same basic plots of these different fairy tales, they changed the main characters, they changed up the story quite a lot. They, they fractured the fairy tale. The same basic structure of it is still there, and it, in essence, the DNA is still there, and the same basic outline of it is still there, but they changed a lot of it, and they changed the overall moral of the story, so that is why it's considered a fractured fairy tale. And you can do this with pretty much any story that you choose. The difference between a fractured retelling and a faithful retelling would be a faithful retelling, while you add some changes here and there, you still keep the same overall plot and the same the same themes and the, the same moral of the story, if, assuming there is one. Whereas a fractured fairy tale, you keep the plot but you change the themes. Then on the other side of things, we have what you could call loose retellings, but I think it's more accurate to say stories that are inspired by. These would be those stories that start with the same premise or a similar premise of the source material and probably borrow a few story elements from the original here and there, but for the most part they don't have much to do with the original and they sort of go off in their own direction. So a great example of this would be Bridget Jones's Diary, which um, is a very, very loosely based off of Pride and Prejudice, specifically the uh, 1995 miniseries, if anyone uh, wanted to know a little trivia, actually inspired the book, which in, in, what inspired the movie. So if you go into Bridget Jones' diary and you think it's going to be a faithful retelling of Pride and Prejudice, you are going to be disappointed, because it is not that. 
However, if you go in knowing that it is a loose retelling, or rather that it is inspired by Pride and Prejudice, so there are certain elements and homages to Pride and Prejudice, callbacks here and there, or you just go in watching it as a movie and you just kind of notice the little touches here and there, it's a much better experience because that is one of the problems when you do retellings is that people are always going to compare it to the original. It's the same problem with reboots and remakes. They always compare it to the source material. However, when you do inspired by stories, you get a little bit more freedom because it's in by it's not literally based off of but some people will be like I don't like the changes you made or why did you do that you took out my favorite character so it's just something to keep in mind so on this side of the spectrum with the inspired by stories that's where things kind of get confusing on what is an inspired by or a loose retelling story and then what is a just straight up fan fiction novel for me personally this is where I draw the distinction you don't have to but this is I do where I think the difference is that a loose retelling would take place during the original source material. So like for example, Wicked. I would consider that a loose retelling or a in story inspired by The Wizard of Oz because it is the Wicked Witch's perspective on all the things that were happening during The Wizard of Oz. Yes, it takes place a little bit before and a little bit after and it gives you her backstory and everything like that, but for the most part it takes place during those events in The Wizard of Oz from the Wicked Witch's perspective, which is why I'd call it a retelling. Fan fiction novel, on the other hand, I would consider to be a continuation from the original story. So like, Death Comes to Pemberley. It picks up where Pride and Prejudice left off, and then it turns it into a gothic mystery. And then a courtroom thriller. So that's all I got for you today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this video on the different types of retellings, how to do them, what different types of changes you can make, how the different ones are distinct, etc, etc. I hope you are enjoying this topic. If you are, please make sure you hit that like button. And if you have a favorite retelling that you think I should look into, it can be a movie or a video game or a TV show or a book, please leave it in the comments below. I'm always looking for new material to bring up in my videos, and I would love to know your recommendations. And of course, happy writing.